we can go ahead and kind of return in. I don't know how to really express how appreciative I am to those of you, especially been here for the entire event, and greatly appreciate that. I want to express that to you. Uh, Kenny Towsley, the preacher for the church at Lynn, will have our next presentation. And before he does, we're going to have Josh Dement lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll turn it over to Brother Kenny. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've blessed us with today and for this great privilege that we've had of coming together here today to study these things that pertain to the kingdom. Father, we pray that you will help us all to be strengthened by the lessons that are presented today, that you will give us even further resolve to press on into the future and carry the gospel to those who are lost. Father, we're grateful for those that have come before. We're thankful for the great heritage of faith that has been passed down to us. And Father, we pray that you will help us to be good stewards of that heritage and that we will continue to, to pass it on to those that come after us. Father, we pray that you'll be with Brother Townsley now as he presents his lesson. Father, we pray that you will give him a good understanding of the material that he has prepared and help him to present it in a way that would be beneficial to all of us. In Christ's name, amen. amen. <laughs> Well, it truly is my pleasure to be here today. I know that, uh, as Brother Steve just said, there have been many here who have persevered, maybe would be the best word, uh, been here for the whole lectureship. Uh, what an encouragement to those who spent the time to prepare, not just the lessons, the book, and those types of things, but to get all of the logistical things ready for this. And it is my privilege to be able to be here today. I will be talking today about the early American restoration movement. Now, there's no doubt if you look, no matter if you're a history buff or not, and if you look at one of the very last things, the very last paragraph that I wrote in the book, it says, I am not a historian. That is going to come across very plainly as I give this lecture. Because it's not something that, it's, that I'm necessarily not interested in. It's just something that I don't seek necessarily and search after. As Brother Lloyd made mention, he said, you know, he doesn't consider himself a preacher. Well, I'm in that same boat, and I'm not a historian also, so I feel very privileged to get to be here today. It's one of those things that when you think about history, just what little bit we know, even going back to high school, no doubt July 4th, 1776, changed the world. Not just this country, but it changed the world. When we declared independence, when we said, okay, we're, we're putting all that away, we're, we're beginning to form this country, we're, we're ready to call ourselves this nation that we love so much. It literally changed the entirety of the world. When you think about the ideas and the practicality that was mentioned early of the people that it took to do that, you have to understand that because of that, it not only changed the way that people thought in the world, but it changed the way this country was formed. You know, they came out of a situation where the, the governing body wanted to control your belief. So the declaring the independence from that, all of a sudden, we found independence in many areas. And that's something that you realize in the founding documents of this country, and many have mentioned those things before. One of the primary things that, that we talk about as a right in this country is the freedom of religion. Now think, of, think about this, if you will. Early on, because of the, the structure of the nation that we live, it, it was, well, helter-skelter may be the right word, willy-nilly. It, it was one of those things that, that the organization wasn't necessarily there yet as people began to do that westward expansion that, that Don and some others have talked about. And oftentimes, in this situation, people took a freedom of religion to mean a freedom from religion. You know, you think about it, in those that northeast part of this country, there was pretty good organization. But as you moved out and went on, so many then didn't have meeting houses, 
those that were of the vocation of standing up and preaching the gospel, as it were, or as it's even mentioned, might not have had access to the word as easily as they went. So when you think about these things, you realize that, that something that gave us the right to go back and, and be and, and understand New Testament Christianity basically also gave people the right to do whatever they wanted to do in the name of religion. I think about there where Jesus Christ makes the statement, there be many who say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not done all of these many things, these great works. And what did he say? Depart from me. I know you not. I don't know who you are. Because they didn't do things his way. And there were so many people in the early part of this country who took the freedom of religion and took it to the extreme of doing all sorts of things in the name of God. Because of that, because of the freedoms that we had, there were those men who began to call to restore. They knew and they could go and they could see the Bible, the, the ones that had the copies of it, they could see there that Christ said, upon this rock I will build my church. Singular in nature, belonging to Christ. And so they said, okay, now we have the freedom. We can begin to restore all this time that has passed since those words were spoken, now in this new land where we are free, we can restore that. And there were men that we're going to talk about today. We're going to speak. Some have already been mentioned and, and, and even elaborated on a little bit. We're going to talk about a few of those because they stood out, so to speak, or, or historically were significant. But we're going to mention some others that were not so. James O'Kelly is one that was given to me. This has already been mentioned. He was raised as a Methodist. He, he was one who did not like the idea of the centralized and, and the one governing head of those things. In that, <coughs> this was all about the same time with John Wesley. Well, on December 25th, 1784, John Wesley sent a letter to the Methodist churches in America and basically released them from the rule of England. But in that same letter, he appointed someone to be over the church in America. James O'Kelly uh, didn't like that. He didn't care for that at all because it basically put the same system in order here that they had just came out of. And that was what he was talking against, preaching against, standing up against it. And in the, in the manuscript you'll go through and you'll see that there was groups as they went through and, and called themselves different things and, and finally being able to settle on Christian. Now James O'Kelly is one that there is great information if you ever have time and you want to do a Google search and those types of things, I would recommend it. There's a lot of information out there. A lot has already been given today. It's already been mentioned and we need to make sure that as we're talking about these men who had a great impact on the early American restoration, they were just men. And they did make mistakes. James O'Kelly's has already been mentioned. He didn't believe that you had to be immersed for remission of sins. I couldn't help but as I was doing some study on this with James O'Kelly and him coming out of and really standing up against so many of the things that the, the Lord's church needs people to stand up for. <coughs> just didn't go quite far enough. I could not be help but be reminded of those early Christians who came out of Judaism, accepted the things of Jesus Christ, and what did they do? They wanted to hold on to circumcision. James O'Kelly had those same kind of struggles, but his had sufficient to just sprinkle. We must be careful. Because as it said, who knows? In some of the youngest folks here, there may be a call for restoration once again, even in this country. We need to make sure if we're going to restore, let's restore it. Don't stop short. Don't quit too early. Of course, there are others that are mentioned. Abner Jones and Elias Smith were already mentioned a little bit. We're going to look at um, a couple of others that are involved in some of these things, and they're very interesting the, the backgrounds that you'll see, uh, John Mulkey being one. His 
call to restoration was one that, that caused a, a great stir. He, he came from a lineage of, of Baptist preachers, and I was visiting with uh, Brother Inman just a little bit ago, and he said, you know, there's, there's a book out there that he has read or he's reading right now that this kind of, this kind of thing being taught from that perspective, the, the Baptist belief, and it, it's very much the same story because there is no doubt, if you know this area very well, there's also a very strong sense of Baptist denomination in this area. Many of us, notice I said us, were raised in that denomination. And so many of these that had a call for restoration came from that same background. And when you see these going all the way back to there, you realize that this is one of the, the major strongholds. And so many in that belief wanted to go back and at least restore parts of the things they knew that they read in the New Testament. And as you go through these things, you'll see that he made very public his doubts about unconditional election. Once saved, always saved. He doubted that. And naturally, because he vocalized that doubt, there began to be division and those types of things. And, and many people, when division comes, they either grow silent or they grow stronger. Moki grew stronger. But he went about and took many followers with him in early America. Now, these things that we're talking about, we need to make sure and understand that in all of this, Many of these things, as they would go about, they would get these groups of followers going after them and going with them, and they would establish congregations around in different places. And we need to understand that that same spirit that caused that Declaration of Independence, that caused us to become a new nation, was the same type of people that were like, okay, if we can, if we can go about and we can do this, we can restore the Lord's church to its once given instruction. They did those things. They were very practical people, as has already been mentioned. Of course, Abner Jones and Elias Smith, oftentimes those two are grouped together. Uh, you'll, you'll see in a lot of writing Smith-Jones type movement. I broke them down into just two small different things. And, and as was mentioned a while ago, there were many who followed the different things that they taught. Uh, there again, both coming from Baptist Background, of course, Elias Smith, as has already been mentioned, did struggle with universalism, back and forth in different things, and, and had trouble with that throughout the years. As a matter of fact, one of the very earliest journals, or uh, I guess doctrinal papers maybe would be a good way to put it, was something that Elias Smith is known for. And with that, he had great influence over many, but then when the doubts of universalism or or the idea of universalism, depending on where he was at in his life, came about, he would stop. He would grow weary. He was one the Bible warns us about, you know, how we, we're told not to be carried about by every wind of doctrine and, and all of those types of things. And unfortunately, Elias Smith struggled with those things. And yet, even in those struggles, he was able to have a great influence over restoring the church in early America. Of course, you can go on, and as was kind of tying to the lesson that was given just before me, if you read in the book about John Wright, he was a member of the German Baptist group, which was mentioned in the last lesson. And, and when you see and you, and you go through any group of people, any group of religious people, there are different ideas in different areas. I don't care if you're talking about this particular denomination or that one, or even in the Lord's church, we find that if we're not very careful in our study. We, we kind of have different ideas on this or different ideas on that. And, and he did those things in the, in the group of Baptists that he was studying and found great inconsistency. So he began to research and, and found the things that he found to be the most detrimental. One of those things in all of this with finding the good following that he did, he basically converted 16 congregations who once worshipped as Baptist. And in that, 
they began to call themselves the Churches of Christ. Isn't it amazing how looking back that seems so simple because the Bible tells us to. But imagine the uproar, the upheaval of, of 16 congregations following after this heresy, so to speak. And all they were doing was going back to the Bible. Restoration in early America was something that uh, caused a great stir. These men were ostracized. They were basically uh, pushed out of so many. Well, as a matter of fact, when we're talking about settling across, John Wright, at the end of all this, his, his movement was basically known as the Indiana movement. That should kind of give us an idea of which direction they went, right? You see, thinking about where this country was founded, Indiana, by the mode of travel at that time, would have been quite a travel. Would have been quite a journey. And yet, in that, the Lord's church was being restored. Rice has already been mentioned, but I want to make sure and mention him because he did have a great influence. His big thing was he thought those who follow the Bible should be just like those in Antioch where they were first called Christians. We should go by Christians and Christians only. He had a great influence over, whether it be James O. Kelly or Smith and Jones or any of those, and even on later with Barton Stone and some of those. That was his, his thing. He also wrote a book, an address to the different religious societies on the sacred import of the Christian name. His work took him to Kentucky. There again, a great journey. I don't know if anybody, I, I did not get to hear the one on the hymnals and different things, the hymns that were talked about last night. In 1815, Rice Haggard penned a hymnal and began to distribute that. He's one of those kind that there's not quite as much information about, but you can clearly see the thumbprint of what he deemed important, and truly it was. I want us to, just a few moments, if you look through the manuscript there, you'll see. I want us to talk about the unnamed. And what I mean by that is, we understand that these people that were mentioned were men. For whatever reason, they were remembered. We know they had their faults. We've pointed some of those out. We understand that it is our desire not to repeat those same flaws that these men showed. But as you go down through all of these, and whether it be the 16 congregations that we talked about or, or James O'Kelly taking half the people from a very large congregation with him as he left and, and all of these different types of things, I want us to think about for a few moments the unnamed, the people that you can't go to Google or go to an archive somewhere and see their name found. Because those are the people that truly restored the Lord's church in America, in early America. They were those practical people that were mentioned earlier, those people that didn't have the influence, the moms and the dads that sat around at, at night and, and would read the word of God and, and to be prepared, even though their vocation was not to stand and preach the word of God, they bound it as frontlets, as it were. They, they spoke about it when they rose up and when they laid down and when they went about their day as they were told. Those are the people that restored the Lord's church here in America, that went back to the Bible. James O'Kelly would have been no one without a following. Smith, Jones, Barton Stone, Alexander Campbell, there would have been none of those without that. I couldn't help but think of as I was looking through this and seeing all those people, knowing that there were people like the mother and grandmother of Timothy who literally instilled in him the things that he held dear even as a young man and was told to keep on from that day forward. I know as we go through some of these things and as we're thinking about all of the idea of restoration, whether it be here, whether it be 
uh, before this country was established or, or even in the latter time. We need to make sure to not forget the unnamed. You know, now, because of this lectureship, there's a book. And if you look in it, there's lots of people there that I consider it a privilege to be listed among that group. But remember how it's already been said more than once. You're to be commended for being here and, and listening to the lectures and, and being diligent in seeking and searching after not only history but truth. There are more people here today whose name is not in that book. And however many years down the road when someone picks it up, that list of names that is there will not do justice to the strength of the Lord's church in this part of the country. Because the strength of the Lord's church is not those of us who stand up in a pulpit. Those of us that get invited to speak on lectureships and write manuscripts. That's not the strength of the Lord's church. Guess what? That wasn't the strength of the Lord's church when they began to restore it in early America. I'm not a historian. I have a passion for the Lord's church because I found it much later in life. I was blessed. And I do know this, that my goal, our goal collectively should be to where we seek and search diligently after the Lord's church, making sure it remains pure as he designed it so that my children, my future grandchildren and generations to come don't have to worry then about going back and once again having a restoration movement. They can just continue on on the foundation that has already been built. Thank you for your time.